I am so excited for this week's guest. I have totally been a fangirl of this particular Instagram influencer for quite a while now. And I was so excited that she agreed to be on Reproductive Rebel and share her wisdom with you. Jamie Arroyo of Hopewell Family Care is going to join us about brain trauma and miscarriage. I found her account originally when I had gone through my own miscarriage and what she had posted, the video where she was talking about all of the brain fog and cognitive issues that she was experiencing or had experienced during her own fertility journey and experience with miscarriage really resonated with me. And I started following her ever since then. So for several years, I've admired at a distance, and I'm so excited to be joined this week by Jamie Arroyo and having a conversation that many of us need to know about and normalize when it comes to the brain trauma that happens with miscarriage. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I'm an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function, and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are. I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. Welcome back to another episode of the Reproductive Rebel podcast. I am so excited about today's guest. I have admired and followed this person for a very long time and totally felt like a fangirl when she responded back and said, yes, I'd be happy to be on your podcast. I am totally honored to welcome Jamie Arroyo on the show today. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm very familiar with your work, but tell me and the listeners a little bit more about who you are and how you got into the work that you do. Well, first and foremost, I'm a wife and I'm a mama of five. And that was a very hard earned title. (laughs) It did not come easily by any means, but I'm also a family nurse practitioner and my clinic is in close to Nashville, Tennessee. It's in the Old Hickory Hermitage area, and we service close to 10,000 patients, many of which are young families. We tend to draw that demographic, I think, because most of our care providers are young and have families. So I do this work both from a personal level, but also because that's the kind of patients that are drawn to us as well. So beautiful. So what drew me to Jamie's work is if you don't follow her on Instagram, it's Hopewell Family Care. And I highly recommend you follow the account because she brings all kinds of wisdom, but with a humorous angle to it so that You just can't help but connect with the information that she shares to help better people's quality of life. And I actually found Jamie's account. And as much as, again, I'm totally having a fangirl moment right here, I love the fact that she talks about lots of different topics and sometimes ones that we aren't always very comfortable talking about. And On Reproductive Rebel, there have been a couple of episodes where we have talked about pregnancy loss and we've talked about miscarriage. And I've been very open about sharing my journey with all of that. And my title as mother has been pretty hard earned as well. So I resonated very deeply with some of the things that she was sharing. And I found her at a time where I had recently had a pregnancy loss. I was almost out of my first trimester. 
And she shared this reel that talked about what happens physiologically in our brain when we go through a miscarriage. And I was like, oh, I have got to get this woman on the show one of these days because this is stuff that people need to know. So that was the topic that I was hoping that we would cover today is just having a conversation about what actually happens after you've had the physical miscarriage and you're trying to reintegrate yourself back into life. Mm -hmm. It's an important one. I think it's one that you said is not talked about. And I think it's very interesting in what sectors it's not talked about. So it's like not necessarily talked about in family. It's not necessarily talked about among friends even. And then one of the most important sectors is not talked about in healthcare. (laughs) It's like the doctor's office doesn't give you any tools or even, you know, I did a poll one time and I wanted to see how many women had been checked in with by a care provider, you know, six weeks later, even three months later, six months later. And I think it was like something under like 10% or 15%. It was crazy. And I thought, okay, the only thing the medical providers are doing is making sure an HCG is down to zero sometimes, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, not that sometimes they don't even check that or an ultrasound if it was a particularly rocky you know, miscarriage to just make sure that your body is healing appropriately. No further than that. There's no brain connection unless, you know, you as the patient are coming back and saying, I have these issues. Mm -hmm. But I think even that is hard to step outside of yourself and go, oh, this isn't normal. You know, these symptoms aren't normal. They require some healing. They require some treatment modality or approach. And to even recognize that is hard when you're going through all of that, you know? So you really do need an advocate and you would hope you could find that in the medical community. It's really a problem and a a really big gap in care, in my opinion. So I completely agree with you. I have had issues with recurrent loss and loss earlier on meaning that, you know, six, seven weeks is a very different experience than when you're almost full first trimester. It's a very different experience than maybe moving into the second trimester. You know what I mean? Like further along, you go along this pregnancy journey, the higher those HCG levels, the deeper your connection with this pregnancy energetically and physically. And you're totally immersed in the grief. And it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between am I experiencing the grief of loss or am I experiencing physical things that like need to be looked at? Mm -hmm. And we have so little open conversation around miscarriage and pregnancy loss in general. And in some ways, I get it. We don't want to invite that energy in, right? We want to be optimistic. This is going to go full term. Everything is going to be beautiful. But the reality is... There are large numbers of people who go through this experience once, sometimes more than once, and every single time it affects who you are, how you Mm -hmm. feel. It changes you fundamentally for the rest of your life. And then when you're dealing with the physical healing side of it on top of all of that, like sometimes I am shocked in my practice at the number of people who don't know the signs of a miscarriage. And then all of a sudden they find themselves in the middle of one and they don't know what to do afterwards. Like I was Mm -hmm. really fortunate. I was under the care of a midwife and she did follow up with me. But Mm -hmm. before I was under the care of the midwife, I had no follow up from practitioners. Mm -hmm. If there was a loss, they would just be like, oh, so do you want to start trying again next month? It's so hard. It's so hard. So when we're looking at pulling apart what's happening when you're going through this process, I would love for you to speak a little bit to how your brain responds as you're going through this part of the healing process, because sometimes it is hard to tell the difference between grief and there's actually something 
happening behind the scenes as well. Yeah. So, you know, they say that trauma from grief can impact the same parts of your brain that even like a traumatic brain injury can impact. And so, you know, the same inflammation and swelling and (laughs) difficulty thinking in the brain fog and the reasoning and all of those faculties that, you know, in order to do normal life, you've got to be able to access. It's saying it could potentially damage the same areas. And so if you don't get any rehab for that, and, you know, that might look a lot different than a car accident, traumatic brain injury, but the same token is that you still need to seek care to rehab the parts of your brain that have just been hugely impacted. And we don't talk about mental health a lot either. Mm -hmm. You know, it's another sector in healthcare that's very stigmatized still. We're in 2024 and I think people are becoming more comfortable with it because the amount of people that experienced anxiety and depression in the pandemic, post-pandemic, and people are like, oh, this is a real life thing. This is, you know, real humans experience this kind of thing. So I think we're starting to talk about it more and I've been really encouraged to see the conversations that are coming up post-pandemic. But back to just the trauma that happens from a miscarriage, that is a huge insult. It is a huge insult to our brain. And it can start to create this other conversation in the background or, you know, it's almost like a bad TV show that's always just like playing in the background and coloring everything that we're doing. That's going to become the modality in which we like see the world if we don't address that healthfully. I talk about our brain patterns or our brain habits kind of like flowing water. It's like a trickle goes down a mountain. It's going to just kind of create this small little indentation in the dirt. But the more and more that water just keeps following that pathway, it's going to erode into like this rut. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to turn into a ditch. And then it's going to turn into a small little stream. And then it's going to be a creek, you know, and then eventually it could be a waterfall. What I'm trying to get at is we want to seek help quickly and seek intervention sooner than later, because otherwise those pathways and those ways of thinking and those damaged patterns kind of can stick with us. And, you know, when we find out 10 years later, oh gosh, we should have been given some help for that. It's going to be a little, not impossible, but a little bit harder to kind of get some of those functions back. And I'm talking about really basic stuff, like making a decision like going out to eat, being able to clean and organize your house, being able to have a healthy conversation with a friend, being able to not be offended or triggered every time you have a conversation with a friend. I'm just like basic things. So yeah, seeking help and getting appropriate help early on, I think is important. You know, and as women, we always want to be so strong. You know, we're the strong ones. And I think we kind of reason ourselves out of, oh, we don't need that. In that somehow maybe that would make us seem less strong, you know, if we seek care, if we seek support for our brain, support for our emotions, support for grief. I think the way I had to like reason it in my brain was I need to do this for my kids and I need to do this for, you know, I have four girls out of my five kids, four girls, one boy. And I need to be regulated for them and I need to demonstrate to them that it is okay to seek care like this. And I was pretty open and honest with them and they saw me going through the processes and emotions. And I don't know, I just had to keep telling myself I'm doing this for others because otherwise I felt weak seeking care and doing it for my patients. I'm a big uh, experiment on myself. I treat myself as a guinea pig. And I will never ask my patients to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. And so I'm still seeking regulations, meaning like this weekend, I'm seeing somebody for a neuroemotional technique. It's something that, you know, if you 
put your back out and you go to the chiropractor, it doesn't mean your back is never going to be out again or that those muscles might not tend to be like a little weaker and you have to seek care routinely. I think it's the same thing for our mental spaces that if you do NET for a while or EMDR or brain spotting or grief counseling, group counseling, talk therapy, I don't care what it is, tapping And, you know, six months later, you think I'm good. I think that's kind of a little bit of a dangerous place to be, Mm -hmm. to think that you're never going to have to revisit it or that mental health care isn't something that needs to kind of be continuous. And you just have to kind of think of it, you know, once you tweak your ankle, you're probably going to be a little bit more prone to tweaking your ankle again. And I think it's the same thing for the neuroplasticity in our brains and the way that our brains work, that once we've experienced trauma, unfortunately, it does change our brain a little bit. And those patterns like to revert back to a dysfunctional way of thinking, being, moving, breathing. So I just like to remind people, like, this isn't like a one and done thing. It is something that I really encourage people to reevaluate. and. I always know when it's time. I'm yelling at my husband a little bit more. I'm irritable with the kids. I'm getting defensive at work. I'm getting like easily offended by friends, you know, things like that. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I can't make a decision. I don't know what to cook for dinner. I have a laundry basket that's overflowing. When I'm starting to feel dysfunction, like kind of ripple into other areas in my life. I'm like, okay, it is definitely time to revisit this. And it is crazy to me how much those things do get better when I seek care. So. Oh, absolutely. I love that you named some of these tools because that was actually going to be one of my questions for you is what types of tools are going to be helpful Because sometimes people just think, well, talk therapy hasn't worked for me. What else is there? And I know when I went through my own loss journey, I used lots of different tools. I did seek energy work. Acupuncture was very helpful for me. I did talk with professionals. Like I utilized a care team to Mm -hmm. help all of the ways that I needed to heal physically, Mm -hmm. emotionally. And really spiritually, because I felt, I know that in the early stages when I had my first couple of losses, I felt like I had done something wrong. And, you know, what did I do wrong? And that felt like a failure to me. So like I was wrestling with that and in my sense of identity, in addition to the fact that I was grieving this loss. And then as I moved through, because I kind of look at healing like a spiral, right? You come around and you're looking at the same situation, but from a slightly different vantage point as you're doing the healing. Yes, you may have certain things that bring up old feelings and patterns for you, but as you're working with professionals to help you with that healing process, you have a different perspective as -hmm. you're going through it, which is why, to your point, I think it's so important to maintain regular support and care, particularly when you've been through a traumatic situation like this. I also wanted to kind of point out the everyday routine things that you highlighted, because I think that's something that we don't pay nearly enough attention to, that everyday decisions, everyday tasks like the laundry getting backed up, being able to make basic decisions like what are we having for dinner? I work in women's health all the time, but I never made that connection until I saw your reel that the reason I felt like I was frozen in space is because I was experiencing brain trauma. And Mm -hmm. because I had gotten to a point and my son was really worried about me. My oldest is 15 and a half. And this was a couple of years ago, but he said that I was like frozen in space. Like I would be asked a question and I just couldn't respond. And Mm -hmm. when I did respond, it didn't really make coherent sense. But I don't recall the situation that way, but they saw that looking in from the outside. So I just kind of wanted to highlight for those who are listening that this affects your day-to-day activities. 
And even sure when we're like, nope, we're going to try again. We're going to just, you know, keep being optimistic because that was totally my husband's perspective. It's okay, babe. We're just going to keep trying. It's going to be okay. And while I loved his little engine that could mentality, and I wanted so badly to believe him and to feel that way, when I didn't do the work at the very beginning in terms of helping to heal my brain, because again, this was something I kind of figured out as I went along, because we don't have this kind of support in our culture, right? Not that we talk about readily enough anyway. I remember that when I did get pregnant again, that joy was stolen by fear. Mm -hmm. Well, what if this happens again? Am I going to make it? Can I do it? And all of that dark cloud rolled in instead of the joy that I was supposed to feel from one end of me to the other that mm -hmm. we were pregnant with a little miracle and it was going to be okay. Yeah, that's a lot to contend with for sure. I do think that everyone is going to respond a little different to therapy and you do kind of need to find your care team. And I think that's kind of a foreign concept because we're taught you go to your doctor, you don't cheat on your doctor. That's it, who you're going to see. But I think that people are slowly warming up to the fact that they can have care teams and it's not disloyalty. I think loyalty to doctors is a really interesting thing. I see it all the time in my practice where, you know, people don't want to tell me I went and I saw this other person and I was like, why wouldn't you share that? That's wonderful. Let's collab. You know, they're not used to that type of approach where someone is inviting of other team members, but you really do need to find your team and really only you are going to be able to determine whether that's a good fit for you or not. Some of my patients love talk therapy. I'm not one of them. I don't do well. I don't feel like I progress well. I have done well with brain spotting. I have done well with neuroemotional technique and tapping, long walks, Epsom salt baths, grounding. You know, some of my patients hate baths, though, and they would hate walking outside, you know, in the cold. That's the last thing that would be on their checklist. And so I think each woman has to honor her own self and kind of listen to her body. And I think the symptoms and the remediation of those symptoms are going to tell you that you are on the right track. So it's not linear and it's definitely, I can't like write a manual to say everybody needs to do X, Y, and Z because what brought you to that moment and you know, the trauma that is potentially already in our DNA, genetically speaking, from mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, can make situations so complex. So one person really just might need talk therapy and they might just need someone to listen to them and to reflect to them, no, it wasn't your fault, you know, because that's a big, you know, rabbit hole. I think many mamas fall down, you know for hours, days, months, years sometimes. Like, was it our fault? hundred percent. But I think it's important for, you know, each woman to find their care team, find their space, and really find that healing that is so unique. And it's going to be, like I said, unique to that series of things that brought you to that moment. Me, I had to unpackage so much more because there was more in my genetics and my DNA, it kind of set me up for a really big fail. And in some ways, you know, there's a silver lining because now I'm able to recount this for other women and notice and spot the ones that do need some extra help. Sure was not fun. But yeah, I think finding your team is a unique journey and just know there's many modalities out there and you're not limited to one and you're not limited to just what your doctor is going to give you or not give you either. I love that. I love that. And yes, I had the very similar experience where I feel like my own process helped me to help others better. And while, you know, it's super painful to go through and I, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone at the same time, I feel like that journey shaped me into the practitioner that I am. And 
set me up to be able to help others in a very meaningful way. So I very much resonate with that statement. From a physical standpoint, as a practitioner, because we have so many holes in support for people who are experiencing this kind of loss, what kinds of, you know, we've talked about the mental health side of it. What kinds of physical support would you feel serve this population best? I don't know if everybody has access to this, but I sure as heck would get on Google and see if there's anybody near you. But for me, one of the things that was just so insulting was at the end of just my time at home resting, I came back into work and I had so much brain fog. I would sit with a patient and I would just like all of a sudden just like stare and could not remember the word I was trying to recall. I couldn't finish the phrases. I was so frustrated. And it was, these words were always like on the tip of my tongue. It was Mm -hmm. like my brain years all of a sudden would just go and just stop. And my brain is like, my major tool that's like (laughs) what I work with every single day. And I was almost equally to tears about that as much as I was the fact that I was still grieving. And my really good friend, Kim Ownby, she's a licensed massage therapist that is also licensed in electronic lymphatic therapy. So let's just try to do some ELT on your brain. Because there's the added insult on one of my losses, I did have to have like a pretty unique surgery afterwards. And so I had anesthesia and I don't do well with anesthesia. My body does not process it out easily. And so we did ELT on my brain and I was so emotional afterwards because the recall came back and my brain fog lifted like in one session. I didn't even have to do another session. And I was just so floored how quickly it worked. But ELT found its feet in both the aesthetic world, I'm working on like jaw lines and mask me mm-hmm. because it is very powerful in moving our limb. So the aesthetic world has used it for a very long time. Even pre-pandemic, it was using it for acne and rosacea and things like that. In the oncology world, they use it for breast cancer patients who have had mastectomy and are finding like they're having swelling in their shoulder and their arm. So, you know, in a very Western sector, they figured out, oh, ELT is very powerful. Now in the integrative sector, we use it for liver support, kidney support, breast, armpit support. It's a very cool modality. You can even, you know, move lymph nodes in your neck. But all that to say is with this particular miscarriage, I just, the brain fog was so severe. And so doing that ELT, I just was like, oh my gosh, that's it. That's awesome. So that's one really important physical modality I recommend. The other one is called Mayan massage or Arvigo. And we're fortunate enough in Middle Tennessee to have two practitioners in the area who have been trained by the Arvigo Institute. And it is not a feel-good massage. In fact, the first time I went, I had not had a miscarriage. I was just guinea pigging myself and going, okay, if I'm going to ask ladies to do this, I'm going to do this first and see what it's all about. And I wanted to punch the therapist because mm-hmm. it, it's all external, but it's you know, over nerves and really sensitive areas. And I was like, I was not expecting this to hurt at all. Yep. It was excruciating at times. And I had to like breathe through some moments I did not expect it to benefit me in any way, but I thought my already pretty good regular period got so much better. So I was so impressed. But fast forward to after losses, I always tell patients, if you have not had an emotional release post miscarriage, or you have any predisposition to anxiety, depression, or anything even deeper or darker that you'd want to actually have your therapist on speed dial or have something set up because my gosh, our Vigo or my massage can just, it can mix you in a way that it can just be such a rush of emotions afterwards. And our hips and our pelvis hold so much emotion and so much pain, but the mental health part is pulling me back. The conversations I'm trying to stay physical. It's still important to bring circulation and blood flow to those areas. 
And a lot of times we're in pain, we're holding our abdominals so tightly and our fascia, and you know, that's going to affect hormone regulation. It's going to affect our ability to have bowel movements, to urinate, to even resume intercourse. So many things in our hips and our pelvis can be affected by miscarriage, pain, trauma. So I really love Mayan or Vigo massage for that. And it's a really specific specialty massage. I really respect the healers that do that. You want to find someone who's actually, you know, classically trained in that because, you know, it can be a powerful tool for good. But, you know, if someone doesn't know what they're doing, you could potentially hurt someone. So, yeah, I completely agree. That is one of the body work aspects that I recommend to people, too. So one of my specialties is actually pelvic steaming and Ayurvedic mm-hmm. massage and pelvic steaming go hand in hand with one another. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I actually collaborate with several practitioners in order to facilitate that complete healing process. So I love that you mentioned that. And yes, it is not a comfortable process at all. I had three periods that I watched transform after I had this type of abdominal work done. The first one, I saw a lot of brown, which, you know, you were saying, I'm trying to stay in the physical side of it because I was asking about that piece, but it is all connected. We hold so much energy and emotion in our pelvic area that you can't help but talk about the connectivity between the two. And my period showed the release of old stuff the first time. (laughs) And then the next one was probably the healthiest, reddest, brightest one I had ever had. And it's really amazing. So, you know, whether you're looking to heal after loss or you're looking to just maybe release trauma that you're holding there, right? Because that can come from all kinds of things. This could be birth trauma. This right. could be pelvic trauma of another kind. Anything you that could have you... fallen skiing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, you know, there's so many things that we as women incur throughout our life. We're just not told like, that's good, that's bad. Seek help for this or that. And so, you know, by the time we get to pregnancy and pregnancy loss, sometimes we're like, what are all these symptoms from? And it's just, we haven't been told, to, you know, to make the dot to dot connection. So absolutely. I love that. So final thoughts. If you were to leave anyone who is going through their healing after loss journey, what would you share with them? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because I had this conversation with myself and I was like, okay, if I could have told myself anything, what would I have told myself? And I really wish I could have dove full on into moving forward, you know, into finding the healing modalities and not stewed in the what did I do wrong category for so long. But I don't know that you can tell a woman, you know, to not do that. I haven't even done like enough research on that particular part to know if that's like a needed stage or what that does in our brain. Does it set the stage for us moving forward? You know, I've had grief of many different kinds, lost a lot of very close people to me very early and then four miscarriages, one being 20 weeks along. And so when you are grieving, I kind of think it can be very messy in that you're not necessarily like reading one book from front to back. I feel like it can be very ADD in that your coffee table has multiple books and you could be in multiple chapters all at the same time. And that's completely okay. And I think that I don't even want to necessarily regret how long I sat in the what did I do wrong phase because whether I liked it or not, that was part of my healing and grief process is literally moving out of that stage to the next. So, you know, I'd love to kind of 
spare other women from the area because that is the suckiest place to be. Yeah, I just don't know if we get to do that or if we get to choose to do that for them. And I could be so well-meaning going, don't ask why or don't try to figure out if it was your fault. But I think I'd be robbing women of that process. And do you know what? I think women's intuition is just one of the most powerful things in the world. Because some patients have had to advocate for themselves and fight for the, oh, no, there is something wrong, Mm -hmm. you know, and I do need to figure out what that is and make sure that we don't do that again. So I think it's a pretty natural place to be. I think it's when you have, you know, turned over all those stones and it's literally still saying it's not your fault then it is then that we can move on. So I don't even know that my own hope for myself, I don't know that I would, you know, take that from another mama because I think it might be a natural part of the process. But I would say I am not the greatest journaler and I wish I was. I just don't think I'm ever going to be. I have found my way of journaling kind of even through Instagram. So I will say, if you are a woman who wants to be with other women and for them in in those moments, maybe one of the things practically you could do is write down a few things that you're feeling because you forget very quickly, Mm -hmm. you know, amnesia sets in and you forget really quickly how raw and how vulnerable you feel and all of those really deep emotional and dark places that you can go. And so, you know, you don't have to write a novel, but just write down a few things so that you could remind yourself every once in a while and go, okay, yeah, what they're going through is very normal and I can be there with them, walk with them because I've walked that. So I think in healthcare, you know, you can remain empathetic and compassionate or you can become like closed off and jaded and it's a very hard work to like remain on this side and continue to be like an open person that sits with people Mm -hmm. in their moment and makes space for them and healthcare doesn't do that well because it's so quick and so fast-paced and moving on to one patient to the other but I think I've kept some of my like power (laughs) <laughs> and moments with women because I've chosen to not be austere and professional, but be this more like empathetic and human being with them. So I get chills in some patient rooms some moment, you know, because I've chosen to stay over here. It is very difficult. It is not easy. It is so hard. Some days I just don't want to do it. But every time I see like before me, a patient just healing. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go home dead tired, but it's worth it. So yeah, those are some of my last thoughts about that. Yeah. (laughs) This is why I do this. And I know exactly that moment that you're talking about where you get the goosebumps and you're like, this is why me showing up in this way is exactly why I needed to do this today. And yes, it is exhausting. I completely resonate with that. (laughs) And I had to learn really early on the difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion because when I was going through aspects of it, it felt very raw to me also. And I had to learn how to get into a place of compassion in order to be able to support my clients as best as possible because otherwise I could feel my own emotional load take over. So I think that's really important that you highlighted that. And I absolutely love that. So. I could talk to you all day. I'm hoping that maybe you'll be open to a part two. We'll talk about something a lot more upbeat and we'll bring some of your amazing humor into it. But if people are looking to connect with you, Jamie, how can they do that? So from a patient standpoint, I'm unfortunately full, but I have people for the longest time were like, clone yourself. (laughs) Like, no, I did it to the best of my abilities. And we have five other just amazing ladies here who all share the same love for people. You can't teach that. You know, I looked far and wide for people to be my teammates and I love them. They just don't want to be the face on Instagram. None of them do. (laughs) I point the camera at them. They're like, please, no. Oh, gosh. (laughs) No, but if you are local and you do want to be a patient, there is new patient paperwork on HopeWellFamilyCare.com. 
and you fill out the patient paperwork. And then it does take some time because we have only a few people going through the multiple new patient requests per week, but they will get to yours. So if you're wanting to become a patient, that is the modality. If you're just wanting to follow along for the humor and the reels and the posts, you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok. It's Hopewell Family Care on both of those. And I do interact with my direct messages quite a bit. If it is a really personal question, I'll probably, you know, defer and say this is a little bit too complex for a direct message, but I save everything in highlights. I have so many highlights. I feel like it's so messy, but people are like, please don't delete those. So there is a lot of free info out there already. I literally do it for my patients. And then it was very interesting. I wasn't expecting it to blow up like it did, but I get every time I'm about ready to shut it down and be like, I can't do this anymore. I'm so done. Somebody comes into my DM and says how much my presence and my platform has changed their life. And I'm like, oh my gosh. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So follow me on there. I would love to see you. And thank you for having me here today and for following me. I love how Instagram and social media connects people like us in this way. So it's pretty fun. Absolutely. I would highly recommend to go follow Jamie. Her work is awesome. I have picked up all kinds of really awesome information as a practitioner even. I love her perspective on things. So definitely go follow. And thank you again so much for making time for this conversation, Jamie. I really appreciate it. And it's really been an honor to talk with you. Yeah, absolutely. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. You too. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeme hydrotherapist and acutonics practitioner, herbalist, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizarry of Moon Essence LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment for one-on-one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like and follow us at Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.